So I'm glad to introduce uh, Thomas Prado. Thomas is from Bordeaux. He's uh, an interesting uh, person uh, to me and, and, and others because he really camps at the interface between, uh, let's say, immunology and philosophy. I, I hope you <laughs> it's not too short of an introduction. And uh, he's been reflecting a lot of, you know, on the, the role of the microbiome as in a way, as said in the title, and the, our other immune system. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, the sort of, of reflection is going to have here. And this is uh, really establishing another uh, angle in the reflection uh, between uh, um, biology and anthropology. Uh, are you okay, Thomas? Or? Okay, I must say that it's been one in France who's been extremely active at, in a way, mobilizing us uh, around these topics, and uh, that was an opportunity to say thank you for this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I will talk about the microbiome as the second immune system. I want to thank Philippe and Brett for organizing this great symposium. I really learned a lot. I must apologize because I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not even a biologist. I'm not even going to talk much about humans, more about biological uh, beings in general with some consequences, I hope, for humans. And as Philip said, I'm a philosopher by training. I was trained both in philosophy and then in immunology. And I became a philosopher of immunology, and now I am an embedded philosopher in an immunology lab, the, the immunology lab of Bordeaux called uh, immunoconcept. So the question I would like to raise with you today is whether we can define immunity as defense of the self against microbes. It is very clearly the case that when you ask a question about the immune system and what it is, the answer you will get is that the immune system is a system of defense. And defense against what? Clearly, mainly against microbes. And this has led to a certain view of biological identity, which is, I think, of interest to both biologists and philosophers, which is that identity uh, of uh, living things should be understood as the preservation of the self against the non-self. But the thing is that recent research has shown that many microbes are tolerated, not rejected by the immune system, and even more, if I can say, microbes can be an essential element for host defense. So the question I want to raise is what are the consequences of this uh, series of data on immune tolerance and on the fact that the microbiota can be protective? What are the consequences on our conception of biological individuality and biological identity and, what, and why it matters for both uh, philosophers and, and biologists and medical doctors as well? Hence, the following outline from the traditional view of immune microbe interactions and biological individuality to the idea of immune tolerance to the microbiota. The second part will be about the protective microbiota, the third about immune roles of the microbiota beyond defense, and the fourth will be about the main conceptual consequence, as I see it, about rethinking uh, biological individuality. Uh, what I'm going to say today is based on the collective work um, a group of people, uh, philosophers, uh, Lin Chu and myself, and uh, medical uh, people, uh, Thierry Schaverbeck and Marie-Elise Truchte, who are both uh, rheumatologists, uh, uh, Laurence, who is a specialist of parasitology, I lost my arrow, here, they, here she is, and uh, Thomas Bazin, who is a gastroenterologist. So this is done at the University of Bordeaux and the CNRS uh, with the Bordeaux Hospital. And I want to insist on the decisive role of these two young people, Lin Xu and Thomas Bazin, who uh, did much of the work, especially the bibliographic work that led to the paper on which my talk uh, today is based, and which is called Protective Microbiota from Localized to Long-Reaching Co-Immunity. So this is what I'm going to explain, and in particular, I'm going to explain why we suggested this new concept of co-immunity and why we use this concept to describe the phenomenon I'm gonna explain now. Um, more generally, um, I think that the kind of collaborative work uh, between uh, philosophers, medical doctors, 
and biologists that led to this paper is an example of what we're trying to do and develop in Bordeaux, uh, which we call philosophy in biology and medicine, uh, which uh, has led to the creation of this institute, Institute for Philosophy in Biology and Medicine, where really we want to put together philosophers, biologists, and medical doctors, not just to talk, but to produce science together. So clearly our aim is to produce science, but a different science in the sense that we are much more conceptually oriented, uh, critically oriented, so to speak, and we try to produce science in scientific publications in a different way. So we are a small group, but if you want to join us, you're much welcome. Um, and also many things I'm going to say today are related to my uh, European Research Council funded project called IDEM, and which is about the microbiota uh, immunity and biological identity. So I now turn to the very first step, which is the move from the traditional view of immune microbe interactions to uh, about biological identity and to the idea of immune tolerance. So the traditional view about host microbe interactions uh, goes a little bit like this. Uh, immunity as the defense of the organism here against microbes, look at this shield, a very powerful one, and uh, the idea is that microbes are almost pathogenic by definition in this, in this view. And this has led to something that was extremely powerful throughout the 20th century, which is the idea that um, the interactions between the host and the microbiota should be understood uh, according to the idea of preservation of the self against the threats of the non-self, especially in Burnett. And as we all know now, we have recently moved from a view of uh, immune microbe interactions a little bit like this to something much more like that, uh, which looks cooler, right? Um, and um, mainly is about the idea that immune tolerance is a massive phenomenon. So something we thought was very limited is in fact absolutely ubiquitous in the living world. So many microbes are actively tolerated by the immune system, and this is not the form of immune ignorance that had been documented for decades, which is very different. In that case, what we say is that the immune system does indeed interact with the microbes. It sees these microbes, but it does not reject those microbes. So there's really active processes, there are active processes of tolerance to these microbes. This microbiota that is tolerated has all sorts of components, bacteria, but also viruses, archaea, fungi. And this led to the idea that the organism, in fact, should be seen as a complex ecosystem made of many biotic elements belonging to different species and even to different kingdoms. And even more importantly, rather than just the presence of these microbes, what has been very striking was the fact that these microbes very often play all sorts of very useful role, roles in the body, uh, relating, related to uh, digestion, metabolism, development, education of the immune system, as we just saw, and many other aspects. So I think this was really the main uh, change in recent immunology in the last 20 or 25 years, uh, which is this very well-documented phenomenon of immune tolerance to microbes. And this has at least two consequences, one about our perception of microbes, and the other about our definition of immunity and individuality. About microbes, um, it is very clear that there's a gap between microbe and pathogenicity. This has been known for a long time. I mean, you find uh, during the 19th century, even before that, many people are saying we should be careful about the idea that a microbe would necessarily be harmful. But I think that what has completely changed is the demonstration that this is a massive phenomenon. That's more, what is normal is rather to interact in a tolerogenic way with microbes rather than reject them. That has changed completely. So it's not because you find quotations of people saying, you know, not all microbes are harmful, that you have something like what we have today, which is a striking demonstration that we must change our conception of what the immune system does with regard to microbes. So this has led to many different ideas about pathogenicity being a contextual question. Pathogens are not intrinsically pathogen or pathogenic. This is mainly a contextual question. Uh, something that is a pathogen at some point can cease to be a pathogen at another point and the other way around. Um, clearly, the next frontier, I believe, is about the virome, and there has been many, many uh, research uh, uh, and data recently about the virome, especially by Skip Virgin, uh, showing the importance of viruses, normal viruses, at least 
10 to 12 types of, of viruses in each of us, which seem to play very important physiological roles in the body. Um, I have suggested this more philosophical uh, investigation about mutualistic viruses and the uh, heteronomy of life. And uh, anthropologist Charlotte, Charlotte Brief, who is in, in the room, are, uh, has this paper in preparation from fighting against to becoming with viruses as companion species. And I think we are all going in this direction of taking into account viruses in our new conception of what microbes are. And the second consequence is about biological individuality. And one very important consequence, drawn in particular by uh, developmental biologist uh, Scott Gilbert, uh, you know, almost 20 years ago, uh, is that we should see the self as a permeable self or permeable I, he suggests in this paper, suggesting that we need now to develop ecological approaches to the organism and to the immune system. Another aspect which is, I think, very important is the need to redefine the boundaries of biological entities uh, based on the critique of the traditional self, non-self framework. And this is what I try to do in my book, The Limits of the Self, Immunology and Biological Identity. Many biologists and philosophers raise the question of who we are in this new microbial, microbial context. Um, some, including Scott Gilbert, suggested a little bit on the model of uh, Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been a Modern, uh, that we have never been individuals. And more recently, uh, Rees, Bosch, and Douglas suggested that the microbiome really challenges our concept of self. But I think this is very important to make a further step. So what we have seen uh, up to now is that the immune system is mainly about uh, interactions with microbes that are very often tolerogenic rather than uh, reactions of uh, rejection. But the next step is what would happen if the microbiota became a part of the immune system that is, became part of what is precisely, or what was precisely supposed to protect the organism against microbes. So is it possible that not only we are constituted by microbes, but the immune system is itself in part constituted by microbes? And this is what the protective microbiota is about. So not only can microbes be benign in the organism, but they can also protect the host in all sorts of ways. Again, I think that this very general idea has been known for quite a long time, but what has, has changed recently is really the massive, uh, uh, the demonstration of the massive extension of this uh, phenomenon in nature, and also all the mechanisms that uh, uh, um, underlie this uh, idea that the uh, microbiota can be protective. So the paper we wrote in Frontiers in Immunology is a very detailed investigation about all the modes of microbiota conferred protection. And I want to emphasize that there are at least four limits um, in our paper. One is that it is host-centered. The second is that it is mammal-centered, uh, even though we emphasize in the paper that um, microbiota conferred protection exist everywhere in the living world. It has been documented in plants, it has been documented everywhere in invertebrates, and this is really a ubiquitous phenomenon, as far as we can say, a very general, probably ubiquitous phenomenon in nature. Our paper is also protection-centered, but I will address this point um, in a few minutes, and it's um, focused on protection against pathogens, not protection against diseases uh, like allergies and diabetes, but you now know everything about protection against allergies. So there are two main ways to protect the host, very simply. One is direct, that is not mediated by the host. So you can have one bug uh, that will uh, eliminate or compete with or uh, with another bug. And it can be indirect in the sense that it will be mediated by the host where uh, one bug will stimulate the immune system of the host, which in turn, oops, sorry, which in turn will uh, fight against uh, a pathogenic microbe. The first uh, major example of microbiota conferred immunity is what has been called colonization resistance. That is host dependent or independent resistance to pathogens that is induced by the microbiota. This is very easy to understand. The situation is very different when uh, niches are vacant and when niches are occupied where the competition can be extremely intense or intensive. And you can also very easily understand that some components of the microbiota can compete or inhibit some pathogens preventing infection of the organism. Colonization resistance has been uh, mentioned uh, since at least uh, 1971, 
but this is recently here again that the phenomenon has been documented in details, um, especially by people like Eric Pamer in a series of uh, papers. And this is probably a phenomenon that is crucial in the first stages of life. And this again has been documented more and more recently. So we think that colonization resistance is a crucial phenomenon. This is really something that is absolutely crucial uh, in uh, microbiota conferred immunity. But what we say in our paper is that there are other layers that are also extremely important. Um, so in other words, there are gaps in the focus on colonization resistance. First, colonization resistance is generally limited to one different strategy, as we saw. Resistant, resistance against pathogen establishment and growth. Second, protective effects of colonization resistance are limited to the immediate vicinity of protective microbes. And we want to say that in addition to colonization resistance, there are at least two other uh, phenomena that are equal, equally important, or at least extremely important, which are containment and disease tolerance. Containment is the spatial restriction of microbes within a particular location inside the host body. They are not eliminated, they are contained. Disease tolerance is the limitation of host tissue damages induced by pathogens without pathogen elimination. This is something that has been well documented uh, in other uh, fields recently. Well, the idea is that you can have a pathogen remaining inside you, but you will uh, limit the damages that uh, this pathogen does. And we also say that it seems likely that the microbiota can have a protective effect at a distance, at a, at a long-reaching distance, uh, based on the idea that it is established that microorganisms in one organ, mainly the gut, can influence immune responses in other organs. In other words, we try to adopt a strongly ecological view about this question of the interactions between the immune system and the microbiota and the possibility for the microbiota itself to be protective. We uh, talk about the different steps of interactions with uh, pathogens, uh, entry, establishment and growth, pathogenic effects and spread. And what we say is that colonization resistance is absolutely crucial, but it is mainly about the first steps. And we must pay attention also to other steps that will then uh, involve disease tolerance and containment. And we say that the microbiota might well be involved in all these different stages and all these different processes. In other words, what we suggest is to have an expanded view about protective microbes, where we say that protective microbes must be thought of depending on their effect, colonization resistance, but also containment, disease tolerance, depending on their range. Is it a localized protection or is it a long-reaching protection? And also, according to their mode, is it direct, microbe to myro, microbe, or indirect, host-mediated protection? And what we say basically is that uh, the literature has focused on colonization resistance and localized protection, but it is also interesting to have a look at these different phenomena and, sorry, and uh, also have a look at long-reaching protection. And basically what we do in the paper, and I will not uh, go through all this, of course, is to show that um, you can have containment that is localized all long-reaching and, and direct or indirect. Disease tolerance can be localized all long-reaching and direct or indirect. We just give you two examples to illustrate what we mean. For example, containment can be localized and direct. This is a famous example uh, documented by Forrest Rohrer's group uh, in which they show that in various organisms, bacteriophages, so viruses, that adhere to mucous glycoproteins can prevent translocation of a bacteria. And this is a host independent protection of mucosal surfaces against bacteria, against bacterial infections. And this is what the author is called a non-host derived immunity. An example of disease tolerance that is localized and indirect. This is the only and the second and, uh, and, 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 and last example I will give is a, a bacteria that's fragilis that affects systemic T cell responses through the action of bacterium derived PSA, polysaccharide A, uh, which protects against pathobiont helicobacter hepaticus colitis, meaning that in that case you have one bacterium that will prevent um, the, an intestinal inflammatory disease which we think is really an example where you have a bug influencing the immune system in the sense of disease tolerance. More speculatively, in the paper, we suggest that protective microbes could probably help the host from a distance, either 
by inducing a systemic response, systemic response meaning a response in all the organism, or protection at a particular remote site. For example, some protective microbiota could be protective against pathogens located in the lung. So this leads us to uh, suggest uh, this term that we have coined, which is the concept of co-immunity. What we call co-immunity is basically a collective immunity, by which we mean a, a form of immune defense associating components of several organisms. That is what we can also call multi-organism immunity or cross-organism immunity. And we believe that what we have described about um, the microbiota being protective is one very important example of that, but there are clearly other examples. Um, Co-immunity, in our view, includes the kind of microbiota mediated immunity I just described, but also the protection of the young by maternal antibodies or population level phenomena, which we believe are absolutely crucial, such as social immunity in insects. For example, they are well documented in termites and herd immunity in humans and cattle. So we think that this concept of co-immunity is very important because it seems that very often organisms will outsource their defense to other entities, including microbes. And we think that this is very important to probably put this co-immunity in the context of other phenomena that have been documented, for example, in eco-immunology or ecological immunology, uh, especially this kind of social immunity phenomena just described here. Immune roles of the microbiota beyond defense. Uh, what has been demonstrated in the last 15 years or so is that it would be completely wrong and at least completely reductionist or insufficient to say that immunity is about defense. Defense is an important part of immunity, that's it. Immunity is about many things. The immune system is involved in all sorts of processes in the organism, especially development in a very decisive way. Repair, especially tissue repair. Housekeeping activities of all sorts. And this is what we suggest in this forthcoming paper that it is very likely that the microbiota might be involved in all these different roles of the immune system. Not only defense, but also, for example, development or repair in a very important way. And this is one uh, recent and very important um, illustration or confirmation of that coming from the group of uh, Yasmin Belkaid at the NIH, showing that uh, there is a form of uh, immunity that is induced by the skin microbiota, which consists in having a specific immunity that is triggered by some microbes that will lead to an efficient tissue repair or skin repair in that case, which is clearly a phenomenon in which you can show this incredible intimate dialogue between microbes, immunity, not for something that is in itself protective, but is much, much more something about repair. And we think that in fact, the microbiota is probably involved in many of these roles, which are more about maintaining the cohesion or the cohesiveness of the organism rather than just defense. Conceptual consequence, rethinking biological individuality. So as we saw, every organism must be seen as an ecosystem from the point of view of the microbiota I presented before and the tolerance to many components of the microbiota. But what I want to say is that it is not any ecosystem. It's a very special ecosystem. Um, and this is a strongly unified ecosystem. And what we think is that the immune system plays a very important role in this unification of a plurality. So in other words, we are all societies, but we are very special societies. We are societies that are individualized or united or unified to a very strong extent. And what I think is that the immune system is absolutely crucial in creating a sort of e pluribus unum. So that is being something that becomes one on the basis of a diversity. And why does the immune system does this? Because the immune system constitutes a principle of inclusion exclusion. The immune system says, this is going to stick together, this is not going to stick together. This is going to be part of the system, this is not going to be part of the system. This is a little bit like the painting of Salvatore Dali, uh, which uh, I used to write this paper, Galatea of the Microbes, where the idea is that something that is diverse is also one, is also unified from another perspective. In our case, the other perspective is the action of the immune system. Very importantly, um, what I'm saying here 
is different from the traditional self, non-self framework. Why is it different? Because what I'm saying here is that the immune system is very important to contribute to define the inside and the outside, but origins is not what matters. I don't think that immune, the immune system cares about the question of whether something comes from the inside or doesn't come from the, from the inside. And the reason for, for that, as we saw, is that the immune system tolerates many foreign entities and will eliminate many self entities. So the idea is that there was a confusion for a long time between the question of inside and outside, the question of boundaries, and the question of origins. Does it come from the inside? Does it come from the outside? I think immunity is much about uh, the question of uh, having an inside and outside without confusing this question with the question of origin. Again, the immune system is not about origin. So I suggest we can use immunity for a better or more precise definition of what a biological individual is and how biological, a biological individual persists through time. This is what I suggested in this paper, what is an organism, an immunological answer. And as I think what we are uh, now uh, discovering increasingly is the fact that every organism is a collective under the surveillance of a surveillance system, which happens to be the immune system, which itself is in part a collective. So I think it's collective all the way down, and what we have to understand is the different ways of putting together or unifying things that uh, might also be seen as a collective. Of course, this has all sorts of therapeutic consequences, or at least uh, therapeutic echoes uh, in the idea of, for example, combating antibiotic-resistant pathogens with intestinal microbiota, uh, or, uh, and, and of course, this is uh, clearly uh, uh, linked to what was mentioned yesterday, the risk associated with antibiotic treatment. I also think that maybe in the future we'll be really able to identify some protective microbes in humans and try to specifically stimulate those microbes, avoiding all sorts of antibiotic-based treatments, for example. So the conclusion is that many microbes are beneficial, some participate in protection, this leads to a reconceptualization of microbes, as I said. It also leads to a redefinition of immunity as co-immunity, as a collective process, a collective phenomenon. Also, it emphasizes the need to rethink immunity, not only as defense, but, but as a multiple role uh, uh, system in the organism. And this also leads to a renewed concept of biological individuality. Uh, we want to thank warmly all these people who were uh, very helpful in writing the paper. We really bugged them with uh, thousands of questions, including Philippe, so thank you very much. And also I want to thank the ERC for funding, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.